Hey, just one more time. Is anyone excited about the Resurrection Sunday that we're celebrating today? Our God is good, amen. He's good. He's great. So now, uh, before I run out of all my time, uh, I just want to let you know, my name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves. You're amazing. Golf clap. Golf clap. You are, though. You are. You know, you, you run around town and... You know, just driving around town, you can have people telling you you're number one. But when you come to church, when you come to church, I I believe that that decision, that that ought to be celebrated. So I just want to take that opportunity to celebrate you and the decision you're making to do that. So we have a mission here at the church. You can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people to becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. Lifelong followers of Jesus. That's what we want to see. People following Jesus with their whole life. We got notes for you if you uh, got a bulletin on your way in. Um, or if you'd like to take notes on your phone, you can download the Version Bible app on your uh, Apple, you know, your iPhone or your superior Android device right here. You can get on there and download. What? What? It is better. It is absolutely. Well, I'm just saying. I mean, facts. Um, you can download the Version Bible app and you can tap the events tab and, and find Lifeline Church on there and all of the notes there because we want you to remember some of these principles we're going to bring forward to you. So just download that app and you can find Lifeline Church under the events and all of those notes will be there for you. So I want to start today off with a um, story from history, a story from history, my history, my history growing up one Easter morning, and I want to tell you the trauma that I experienced as a child growing up one Easter morning, because we weren't raised in church. My sister and I, I have an older sister, we weren't raised in church, um, but you know, I know my mom is watching right now. They raised us so good. Mom, you raised us so good. You did such a good job. Hello to everyone online. I see you. I see you. I haven't forgot about you. I love you. I'm glad that you're able to join us today on this Resurrection Sunday. Now, one year, one year very special, we we were doing the regular thing. You know, uh, it's not like it is now. We actually painted real eggs. Amen, somebody? Real eggs. We had to paint them, and there was like, it was work, okay? Easter was work. You didn't just buy a bunch of plastic eggs from the store with candy already in them. Easy. I mean, come on. The kids today... They just don't know that you had to do paint. You had to do art projects to get the candy. So here I am as a kid. Uh, we we're painting and everything. We, and what we did in my family is we put the eggs out on the front porch. Anybody else? You put the eggs out on the front porch the night before, and then the Easter bunny would come and hide all the eggs. There's some kids in here. They're like, Mommy, what's he talking about? Why did he do air quotes with Easter bunny? You're welcome. I'll let you deal with that. Um, but the Easter bunny came, and and... Would, would hide all the eggs. Well, one year, this is one of, the, one, of the most, one of the most memorable Easter's for me. I woke up one morning, Easter Sunday, and I'm like, oh, man, it's going down. Yeah, cannot wait to get at some peeps. Cannot wait to eat some of that. Cannot wait to get out here and find some of these eggs. And I went out. I whip open the front door, and all the eggs were still there. I'm like, what, what's, what happened? What's, what's going on? And so I was shocked and perplexed. As an eight-year-old boy, right? my mom told me, and this is what my mom, and God bless moms everywhere. My mom told me the Easter bunny must have been running late and must have been running late and was, and was falling behind and must have been late getting to our house. And I thought even as an eight-year-old boy or however old I was, that was suspect to me. That was a red flag right there. I'm, and I'm like a little kid and I'm already looking for red flags, like three red flags right there, bunny. I thought you were magic. How could you be late? This is not working. And, but my mom went on to tell me that if I would just wait, if I would just wait for a little while, that the bunny would probably hide the eggs, but only if I wasn't looking outside. <laughs> Do you remember this, mom? The suspect. Red flags all across. Like my, I was, couldn't think of anything. I'm like, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I may be a little kid, but this is not adding up. This is not adding up. So what I did is I kept one eye on mom and dad all morning. I'm looking at them. I'm like, yeah, yeah, Easter Bunny's coming. I'm sure. I'm sure. Side eyes all the way over. I'm like, yeah, what's up? Wait, where are you going? Where are you going? My dad would be like doing Sudoku, whatever, and then he would get up to move them. Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you headed? And so finally, and I kept my eyes on them the whole time. The whole time. I was, my eyes were locked. I was watching them. I was not looking outside. And so finally, I couldn't help it anymore. Uh, I whip open the front door again, and all the eggs were gone. 
I couldn't believe my eyes. It was a Christmas miracle. Christmas miracle. I couldn't believe it. They must have called the neighbors or the bunny was real. I couldn't believe it. Something happened, and I, I, I didn't know what it was. And that, that story, I'm telling you that story because definitely there was some smoke and mirrors involved. Like, my parents, you did a good job. I just want to honor my mother and father today. See, I'm after some long life here, so I'm honoring my mother and father. But they did something. I don't know how they did it. And, and, and I was just so excited because uh, t- that day, magic was real. Magic was real. But of course, of course, Easter is not about a bunny. Easter is not about the candy. It's not about the eggs. It's not about any of that stuff. Easter is about the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and how he paid the price for us. And not only that. He also raised to life again so that the same power that lives in, in, in Jesus, that raised him from the dead, also lives in us. Amen? Somebody, somebody believes that. I know it. That is what we celebrate Easter for. That's what this is about. This is a resurrection Sunday. But how I want to segue into the scripture that we're going to read today is I want to let you know that some of the followers of Jesus had a similar experience that I did that faithful Easter morning. They were perplexed. They were like, how could this happen? The, 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 the followers of Jesus had this happen to them. They didn't know exactly how the resurrection happened, but because it happened, they knew that their lives had changed and their understanding about the reality that they lived in the spiritual world had to change because what they were expecting got blown out of the water, just like me. So let's read this story together. It's gonna be found in Luke chapter 24, the gospel of Luke chapter 24. And I'm just gonna read straight through, taking a few breaks along the way, just to break a few things down. Hopefully it's gonna illuminate this life of faith we live, starting in verse one of Luke 24. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went into the tomb, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. Everyone say prepared. See, here's, here's the first little note I want to make to you. Sometimes what you bring to church with you on a Sunday, the situation you want fixed, the problem that you want solved, isn't even close to what God wants to do in your life. Listen, the, the women that day, they came to the tomb of Jesus to make the dead body of Jesus smell better. That was their idea of what they had planned. Like, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is going to be the good day. We're going we're gonna to anoint Jesus' dead body. And some of us feel that same way. Lord, would you just like spray some Axe body spray on my bad situation? I know I haven't showered in 30 days, but Axe body spray, just cover the thing up. But what the followers of Jesus, the earliest followers of Jesus realized, and what I want us to realize is what we think the solution is, is not even close to how good God is prepared to be to you in your life. He wants to raise your situation to life. He doesn't want to put a Band-Aid on your circumstances, on your, on your broken relationships, on the things that you're struggling with. He wants to raise you back to life and give you a new kind of life that you didn't even imagine you could have. Somebody say amen. amen. That is a good place to say amen, Lord. I receive that. I receive that. I'm asking you to believe today that God is not only able to do that, but he's also willing. Yeah. It's one thing to believe that God is able to work a miracle. It's another thing entirely to believe that God wants to. I'm here to tell you, he wants to. He's not only able to do it, he wants to do it. He's able and willing to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. Verse two goes on to say this. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Let me tell you about this stone really quick. This stone was probably, I did a little bit of research, all right? I, I know I, I, I don't look like an academic. I, this jacket helps a, a lot. So that's why I wear it. Like I trust that guy. Look at him. He looks like a pastor. That's why I have to wear this. I mean, I don't know if I can trust that hairdo, but I can definitely trust that jacket (laughs) right now. I did a little research about this stone. It's about six feet tall, so right about here, right about here. And it uh, it was somewhere between one to two inches thick, which made it somewhere between two to 4,000 pounds, this stone. And it wasn't just rolled into the place of the tomb. There was also a divot cut in front of the entrance so that when it was, it, it would roll in front of the entrance and it would rest into place. So it was kind of stuck there. So not only would it have to be rolled out of the way, it would have to be lifted and moved out of the way. What does that mean to us? What that means is you came, you showed up, but God's power went before you. As, as Adam was talking about, and something I used to say on repeat on Sunday mornings, is you're not here by accident. God has been rolling away the stone for you. He's been been removing the obstacles. 
all those, those things that when we think about going to church and we're like, oh, I'm going to wake up this morning. I don't know if I just feel. He's moving that stone out of the way. He's moving those pieces out of the way. Or maybe he's bringing some people into your life that are inviting you, that are bringing you. And this is not by accident today. This is not by accident. God has something he has specially planned for you. God is not done moving stones out of the way. Amen, somebody. Opening the door for you to be here. It's not by your power that you made the way open. It's by his power, but we still have to walk through it. We still have to walk through it. Verse 3, so they went in. Everyone say they went in. Amen. All right, God moved the stone out of the way, but there's still some things that we need to, we need to do. We still have to show up. We still have to be the ones to say, all right, God, you open the door. You be, I've been invited by three different people. I can't understand it. Maybe it was online. Maybe it was from, from something on the internet. Maybe you just drove by, saw the sign. I don't know how you got here today, but God has been opening the door wide for you to be here. And it's not by accident, and it's not a one-time event. But it's up to us to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some steps towards you. I'm going to take some, and that's exactly what they did. They went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. Where did the eggs go, right? That's exactly how I felt. I was reading this this week. I'm like, that's how it felt. It's like Jesus is gone. The eggs are gone. I get it now. I get it why we have the eggs. This is it. Verse four, though. Let's continue. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground when the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive as if they were supposed to know? I'm so glad that sarcasm ended its way up in scripture. So funny, funny angel. I'm terrified right now and then you're being sarcastic with me. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. As if it was supposed to be obvious. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Amen. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that would, he would rise again on the third day. So they remembered that he had said this. They rushed back from the tomb. These are the women now to tell the 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, it was Joanna, Mary, the, mo the mother of James, and sev several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. Isn't it just like a group of men? <laughs> to not listen to a group of women. I don't know. I, I was really on the fence about telling that joke, and that joke didn't land very well first service either, by the way. <laughs> was not well received. But... I'm just saying, well, let, let me paint the picture for you again. Just one more quick break here that this is, this is telling us. Let me encourage you in something. If this whole Jesus thing seems really far-fetched sometimes, I get it. I understand. I was not raised in church. I was not raised to always believe certain things. I had to come into this faith as an adult, and I, I didn't always understand. So if you feel that way, believe me, I get it. I understand what that feels like. If this whole Jesus thing doesn't make sense sometimes, it's okay. The first disciples of Jesus didn't believe it either. They didn't believe that. And these are the men that were with Jesus for three years. They saw him walk on water. I never saw any of that. They saw him walk on water. They saw him multiply the loaves and fishes. They saw him call Lazarus out of the grave. And here come the women to say, look, he's raised from the dead. And they're like, nah, no way. Like they hadn't seen such miraculous things, but even though we've seen God work in the past, sometimes it's still hard. Yeah. I get that. We all do. All the people you see on this platform, all the, all the leaders around here, believe me, we're on the same page. We all work towards this faith. We work out our own faith and salvation and fear and trembling. And rest assured, the first disciples of Jesus had to struggle through that too. So that's good news for us. Here at Lifeline, we want this to be a place where you can go along your faith journey, no matter how far along you are, without, without condemnation, without judgment. If you are so new in the Lord and, and you just don't know anything, believe me, we have endeavored, we have tried, and we continue to remind ourselves this is a place where people can go on this journey together, and it's a safe space for them to go, you know what, I don't know everything, but I know God's drawing me in. That's all I know. If that's all you know today, Look, you're a lot like these disciples in the story we're reading right now, so you're doing pretty good. I'm proud of you. But there's also a place among us here for those that are ready to jump up and say, I got to see this for myself. I'm ready to put myself out there. Enter Peter. Peter, who Tiffany was talking about. Pastor Tiffany brought this up so, so well. Verse 12, however, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings, and then he went home again 
wondering what had happened. He didn't, he didn't have all the answers, everybody. He didn't have the answers. He didn't know what had happened. All he knew is that something was happening. Have you ever felt that? I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I'm feeling this way. I don't know why I'm being drawn here. All I know is something is happening. Uh, some of us feel that way today, and I, I, I don't have all the answers. I, I don't know, but God's on the move, and I feel like he's drawing me in, and I just want to take steps towards that. That's it. Maybe you just feel something. You're not quite sure what to do about it. Trust me, I've been there. Uh, just like the resurrection story, there's nothing like a good tragedy. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> there's nothing like a good tragedy to bring us face to face with the power of God and our need for him. I want to tell you that I wouldn't even be here today. I wouldn't even be here today if it wasn't for a series of tragic events in my life. I've told you guys recently, I've been telling this story a lot lately because it's just been on my mind a lot lately. God's been wonderful. He's been so good here at the church doing so many wonderful things. And it reminds me of my shortcomings. It reminds me of my hard times. And just to get it out of the way, I'm a pastor with a past. Okay, I, I, I wasn't always living right. I suffered from major addiction and alcoholism early on in life and all the way through the early parts of my adulthood as well. In fact, um, I even had a son that was born during my running around and during my life of, you know, just rebelling, really. My parents raised me well, but I just went off on my own way. And I've told this story before, so forgive me if you're hearing it again, but it's so, it's so real to me that I have to share it this way. I was sitting one night on a box spring mattress in a dirty apartment, and I didn't know anything else other than I was so miserable, I didn't want to live anymore. I didn't want to live anymore. And so I wasn't raised in church at all, mind you. Keep that in mind. I didn't even know if he was real or not, but I'd heard about him, right? I'd heard about him. So I prayed a prayer like this, God, if you're real, I'm so embarrassing to have to tell that. Here I am, you know, here I am with my jacket on and my cool little necklace. Like, look at this, he got his all stuffed together. I didn't even know. I didn't even know. That's how bad I struggled. That's how much I struggled. I didn't have anything. You would not have recognized me back then. Let's just put it that way. I prayed, and this is the prayer I prayed. God, if you're real, get me out of this. I didn't say amen or nothing after that. Just, God, if you're real, get me out of this. And then I moseyed on because I was so desperate. That night, I got arrested for the very last time. The very last time, and they sent me to a town called Stockton, California. Never heard of it before. <laughs> Never heard of it before. But I know Stockton as a place of salvation and sobriety and healing. And that's how I see Stockton. And I think, I think God has his eyes on this whole San Joaquin Valley and Lifeline. We're going to take it by storm. Let's go. We're going to bring life and be a lifeline to this community. But that was one tragic event that brought me close to Jesus, and I was saved there. I was saved there. But there was another event I want to tell you about because I was saved for a couple years, and I had salvation. I had Jesus in my heart, you know, just like the kids were singing about. Me and the kids' faith, they were about the same. You know, I could have been on my knees, you know. This I know because the Bible told me so. I don't know anything else. I really don't know. But that's where I was, and I was just living my life. I worked a couple jobs. I was going back to school full time. All I knew was like to find my identity somewhere. I'll find it in working, making money, doing all that. So for two years, I was saved and not going to a church home. I didn't have a church home. I wasn't going to church nowhere. And let me just tell you something. That almost destroyed my life. It almost destroyed my life. But I'll tell you the story. I was working at my main breadwinning job, my main breadwinning job. And I liked it there. I, was, I had a lot of good friends there. It was good. It was good times. And it, a lot of the staff was young, just like me. Um, I was in my early 20s. We all were. And I felt like um, things were going good, except one day I showed up 15 minutes late. Clocked in 15 minutes late. Oh, so sorry, so sorry. And I, I, I find out a little bit later that I, I was getting fired over that. I hadn't been, I hadn't been wrote up. Of course, everybody thinks their firing is unjust, right? I'm not the only person. I didn't do it. I didn't. It wasn't my fault. But I'm telling the story, all right? So I get to tell the details. I felt it was unjust, and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to pay off these, these debts that I have? I was still paying off debt from my past. What am I going to, I just was, I was distraught, really. I was so depressed. Have you ever lost anything? Have you ever lost a job, lost a relationship, lost something, and just been like, what am I going to do? And I had no clue what I was going to do, no clue. At the time, I was living uh, with someone, I was living with, uh, with another family, actually, and they were going to a church um, on the corner of Park and Hutchins called Faith Fellowship. 
Faith Fellowship, as it was known at the time. And I knew they went there, and I had kind of poked around, but I'd never been, because I'd always worked on Sunday mornings. Always, always. But I lost that job, and it was on a Saturday. I remember it because this is how it happened. I, I got fired on a Saturday, and that day, I was so broken, so heartbroken, I tears in my eyes. I was just messed up. And so I, I, I walk in to the church building, and they just so happened to have the doors open, and they were doing a calendar planning meeting. Oh, it was so, so inspirational, right? It was so powerful. They were like, well, we're going to have a we're going to have a youth camp here and maybe a worship night over here. We're like, what are those things? I don't even know what you're talking about. I didn't care, though. You ever been there? Like, you, you don't know what's going on. You don't know. All I know is I need something. I need someone. And I've got this tragic event that is drawing me in. And, and where I ran, what I, I hope all of you will remember this and continue to run in your tragedy. Run to Jesus. He has you. Because once I started coming there, and I, and I stopped working on Sunday mornings from that time forward, and I happened to meet a, a lovely blonde thing up on the platform as she was playing her guitar. You didn't know Pastor Tiffany could play guitar. She was swaying it like this. Oh, they had a fan blowing up, and the hair was fluttering. And I'm like, this is the church for me. I love it here. Nobody told me about all this. Oh, my goodness gracious. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It's, well, it's, it's, this is a place of truth, all right? I have to tell the truth. This is, that didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. That, that's what, that's, I, I kept coming back. I kept coming back, and I was getting other jobs, and I was like, nope, can't work Sunday mornings. Nope, can't work Wednesday nights either. Nope, can't work Thursday nights either because we got something we're going to do there, and, and jobs are just like, what? You're never going to get a job anywhere. I'm like, I don't care because I found something that had been missing, and it was only because of tragedy. It was only because of heartbreak. It was only because of a hard time that I had been through something that drove me to Jesus in a way that I had never been with him before. It was a new level. What I want to tell you is this. Like, see, you can't appreciate how ugly these eggs are. I painted these myself. They're terrible. All right? I want you to visualize your problems just like this. This is a nothing burger. You cannot do anything with this. It's ugly. This is your problem. All right? This is your heartbreak. This is your pain. What God wants to do is he wants to show you that on the inside of that, there's something brand new. There's something useful in the midst of your heartbreak and your suffering. That's why Paul says that through our suffering, we are made perfect in Christ. Even though you are going through a hard time, God wants to use your brokenness to do something new and give you sustenance and sustain you in a way that he never has before. But it's only until we're cracked open and open to receive the love of God in a new way. Come on, is someone seeing that God wants to use your problems, your trials, your struggles, your heartache to do something new in your life? Somebody say amen. Help me out here. This is, this is how, exactly what I went through. This is exactly what I struggled with so much. This is exactly, I hope, Easter 2023, I hope this is what you're feeling, that God wants to use your brokenness and your circumstances to be a blessing, a blessing in disguise, as they say. His death and resurrection it means our life. Likewise, your hurting and brokenness is a starting place for a new beginning. In other words, if you're not dead, God's not done with you. If you're still taking breath, if you are still drawing in the breath of life, God can still use you. He can still redeem you. He can still do something. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, if you are not dead, there is still plenty God can do to bless your life. In fact, I'm sorry to say, it's when it's, we're at our lowest that God shows up the best. That's why I'm always, I'm always very tender towards people that, that are having a struggle, that are having a hardship, that are having relationship struggles, God struggles. Because of the cross, I'm telling you, you are covered, you are counted, you're redeemed, you're made new. Because he rose again, every obstacle is an opportunity to trust God's power in a new way that you never have before. Because behind every problem, there's a promise of his provision. Did you know God wants to provide for you today? Every catastrophe in your life can be a catalyst for a new beginning because he lives. That means if you're struggling with your job, perhaps, if you're struggling finding a job, maybe you're looking for a promotion, something that, that God is not done, and he might just use your heartbreak 
to draw you to a place in life where you trust him in a brand new way that you never would have come to otherwise. If you're struggling financially, hello, it's tax season, somebody. If the tax man wasn't good to you this year and, or if anything, if you're struggling financially, you got bills, you got debt, believe me, I understand. And some of that heartbreak can draw us closer to God than we've ever been before. Here's the big one. Here's the biggest one. Relationships. Relationships. If, you, if you're having a struggle in, with your parenting, uh, a, a struggle, husband and wife struggle, marriage, parenting, maybe it's an maybe it's a in-law, something. It's, it's relationship pain that is the worst pain that we can experience. Don't say amen too loud because they're with you today. <laughs> but I'm serious. You all, you all know. You all know. That's why. That's why. And this is really, really important to me. Um, I've been waiting for so long to tell you this. Uh, it's back in November I got this idea, and I really wanted to bring the best series and the best content of our entire year starting next week. Next week, we're starting a series called All In, The Family. And the reason it's called that is because it's only when we go all in. That's the only way we win with family. It's the only way we win in our marriage. That's the only way we win in our parenting. It's not hedging our bets and kind of like taking little risk. No, it's only when we go all in and say, here I am. It's all of me. This is all or nothing. I am here for my family. I'm here for my marriage. I'm here for, for this parenting relationship. And I, I bet you would be surprised as some of these leaders you see up here, some of the leaders like myself or some of these other leaders that you think, I'm just kind of getting inside your head for a minute. You think that they got their stuff all together all the time. They never have any problems. They've never been through anything. But I I walked around with a camera over the last several months, and I've recorded some testimonies of some leaders around here that have been through very real struggles, and, and I, their insight, what they're going to bring to the table, is going to bless you so much. Next week, we're, this, this series is going to start, and I don't want you to miss it. Would you like to see a sneak peek of this? I actually got it on video for you if you'd like to see it. Come on, guys. Let's just roll that. Let's check this out together. It's going to be so powerful. Teresa and I met in 1972, right? Yes, 50 years next year, married. Her favorite food uh, is anything with chicken. I do love chicken, but it's sushi. Oh. We just never yeah. eat it. It's so, <laughs> so really close. They're very similar. <laughs> oh A group of guys in their 40s and 50s that go out and play skateboards AKA Danger Sticks, AKA I'm a wood pusher. I mean, we're, we're out there with kids, guys in their 20s, and we're the old man crew, you know? And so uh, we, got, we get out there and get it done. I'd, I'd say that's pretty weird and crazy. A lady's faith is important to me. They say opposites attract. I think a lot of, you have to have something in common. And if anything's gonna be in common, it needs to be the faith. You, you need to build your relationship and ha have that foundation set around you guys. I'll never forget the day that he looked me like dead in the eyes and he said, I don't know what it is that's going on, but I know there's more to it. And so we are going to figure it out together and I'm not going anywhere. That was a huge moment because that was my first time really with any human, like feeling that like unconditional love. There was just so much healing in that moment. And then it opened up a door for me to have a deeper relationship with God because, you know, if my husband is going to love me through this messy stuff, how much more does my father love me through this messy stuff? All through my teen years, I had friends, but I was very selfish. And it wasn't until finding God, or God finding me and, and, and shaking me up, through that, God taught me to, to be generous and to be giving and, and to think of other people more. Uh, advice for the struggling parent would be to see the long range view of it all. And through it all, God prevails and God loves you, and God loves your children through it all. Yeah, just cling to Jesus. This is, this is good stuff. <laughs> Come on, let's give it up for these leaders, too. I know that that can be a bit of a tender situation, a tender moment, because I know that there's, there's real struggle in this room today. There's real things that you've been through. There's real things that you've struggled with that some of those stories are going to touch that nerve. But I just want to encourage you, don't miss next week. Next week, we're going to start it with the, probably the biggest one, which is the marriage 
testimony. If you are married or ever want to be married, believe me, don't miss this message next week. I'm going to bring, I'm not going to leave, I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm going to tell you everything that we've ever been through and every way we've ever overcome it. Shallon and Anthony have been willing to be vulnerable and, and to share things that have helped them. You will be shocked and encouraged to know that even these spiritual people out here, we've been through some of the same struggles. God wants to bless you. He wants to encourage you in those struggles. This relationship seri series is going to be a game changer for you. And I don't want you to miss that. Because with Jesus, every failure that you experience, you can have a future. When things seem hopeless, you can have hope because of Jesus and what he did. But in order to turn our mistakes into miracles, to turn your brokenness into blessing, you need to believe that Jesus is who he said he was and take one step at a time towards him. I just want to finish today telling you one kind of personal story. And it just happened this week. And so this is really raw, kind of new for me. It's not normally like me, but I mean, it just happened and it, it was so applicable that I, I wanted to share it with you. Um, like I told you, I have a son from, from back in my addiction. He's 18 now. I know you're looking at me like, there's no way he has an 18-year-old. <laughs> but I do. He's going to be 19 soon. And uh, he's a grown man now. You know, he's got his own job. He lives out of town. He's always lived with his mom. He's done a, he's done a great job. He's doing, he's doing so, so well in life. But he's got his own life. He's working and doing all that. So I don't see him as much as, you know, I want to or, you know, as much as I feel like I want him to see me too. But I communicated to him that any time, any time he reached out to me, any time he wanted to spend time, hang out, be together, that I would, I would be there. It doesn't matter if we have the biggest outreach going on. It doesn't matter if it's Easter week. It doesn't matter anything. I, I will be there. I will be there. So guess what? <laughs> he calls me on Easter week. Which, if you know anything about pastoring or churches, this is like my busiest week of the entire year. I got so much stress and anxiety. I, all of this white right here is from Easter's past. It's just so stressful, but it's, it's beautiful and wonderful. But he calls, and he wanted to get, get together with me and go to Top Golf on Thursday night. Thursday night I've, I must have had two other events going on Thursday night. And I said, absolutely, I'll be there. Let's go. I canceled. I called everybody. I canceled with everybody. And told them all, you know, sorry, can't make it. My son's coming to town, and you are second. <laughs> you know, God is first, he's second, you know, and, and all of that. I just let them know, and nobody, nobody called foul. Everybody was happy. Everybody's good. Everybody was understanding. And, but Thursday came, and he got called in. And you know, it's, you know, you get called in sometimes. But I have to be honest with you. I was disappointed. I was really looking forward to that. I was really looking forward to seeing him, spending time with him. And um, I know he felt bad too because he wants to do right by his job. He wants to do the right thing. And he felt bad. And I felt like I had an opportunity in that moment um, to teach him something godly, to show him something. I'm not a perfect father, but I had a chance right there in that moment to show him something. And I, I communicated it doesn't matter how many times you call and it doesn't matter how many times you cancel. I will always, always be there. I will, I will always be ready. Always be ready. It doesn't matter if every week you call and then you don't show. I don't care. I will always be there and the one time you do come, I'll be there. That's not his situation, but I wanted him to know and I wanted him to feel your father will be there for you. And there is nothing work-related, church-related that's going to be more important than me just spending time with you. I hope he felt that, but I hope you feel it too. Because maybe you've made some mistakes and you've, you've told God you're going to do something and, oh God, I'm going to get it this time and, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore, but then you do it. And you might have this thought in your mind like he's getting sick of it. He's not sick of it. The only thing he is is sick from not 
being with you. He wants to be with you. And he's, he will say yes every time. There is a story in the Bible of the prodigal son, the one that stole everything, took everything from the father, that went and ran, ran around, ran amok, and left the father. But the story goes, Jesus told this story, that the, that the son went, maybe, just maybe, my, my father will take me back. And maybe I can be a hired hand in his house. Maybe I can just, maybe he'll barely let me back into the house. But the story goes that the father was on the front porch waiting. Day after day after day after day waiting. And as soon as he saw the son from a distance, that he went running towards the son and said, I've been waiting for this moment. I've been waiting for this day. Here's a ring to put on your finger. We're going to have a feast together because my son who was lost is now found. If you think for a second that God is not ready to welcome you back and take you back in no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've experienced, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've promised, no matter what you said you were going to do and didn't come through with. No, he's waiting for this moment because he makes old, yucky, bad, old things brand new again. That's who he is. That's who he wants to be for you. I would encourage you today, just take a step towards him. I know it's Easter. This is the day. You're supposed to come whatever. No, 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 no. There is no accident you're here today. There is no accident you're here today and hearing about what we're going to start talking about starting next week. It is no mistake. It is no accident. God has something for you. You are his son. You are his daughter. He wants to have relationship with you. He wants to have fellowship with you through, through his family, through this. What we talk about here at the church is just give him, give him one year. You know, if you're not sure what to do, where to go, how to do it, like we have testimony after testimony of people saying, all right, I'll, I'll try it. I'll just come to church. I'll do the small groups, whatever you got. And it doesn't take a whole year to realize, oh, God showed up. God showed up in my, my marriage. He showed up in my family. He showed up in my, my bad circumstances. God wants to help you. He wants to bless you. If you're ready to take one step today, I want to tell you it's, it's the perfect day. God's been drawing you into this moment. So I want to extend an invitation to you. If you would, just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. This is a moment between you and the Lord. I'd, I hope you take it. I hope you take it. Lord, open our hearts and minds today. And I want to speak to two groups of people. Maybe a group that used to be walking with the Lord. Um, maybe you used to be very faithful in the things of of the Lord and, and church and the Bible and all the stuff, but somewhere along the way just became distant, just got lost along the way. I want to tell you that the Father is so eager to have you back. He is so eager to have you back. There is no shame, no guilt, no condemnation for you. This next step is for you. But maybe you've never actually taken a step like that. And I want to tell you, we are, we are prepared to celebrate so, so much around your decision today. And it's just one step of faith to say, Lord, I know you're real. I know you sent your son, Jesus, that I'm on a cross for my sin. So if that's you today, if you're ready to take a step back towards Jesus, if you would, just a private moment, just to lift your hand to say, that's me. Pastor, that's me. Just go ahead, be bold. Lift it up right now and say, that's me. Amen, I see you and you. I see you and you and you and you. Hallelujah. And you, amen, amen. Church family, Let's pray together. And if it's your prayer, it's not about the hand. It's about the confession of the heart. Church, if you would pray together with me. Say, Father God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me new. In Jesus' name, amen.